Welcome to episode 161 of EcoSY. Today we have Tom Dimitrovich back with us for a hero conversation. We get to learn more about the man behind the screen, and you'll have to listen to more to hear what I mean when I say that. We're going to hear about how Tom ended up working at Eaton, as well as some insight about his family, what really drives him every day, and some great stories about the people that helped him get to where he's at. His passion for industry shines throughout this episode, and we are so thankful to, to have him join us again. Also, don't forget, listeners, send us those industry war stories. We really want them. We want the good, the tough, the inspiring. Send us that short clip or write in to have your story featured on an upcoming episode of Eco Ask Why. You can always keep those stories generic and exclude company names and things like that. You can get your submissions to us through a direct message on Instagram or Facebook. You can find the links in the show notes, and we look forward to hearing from all facets of industry. Now, without further ado, let's sit down with Mr. Tom Dimitrovich and find out what drives him on this episode of Eco Ask Why. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero conversation. I'm very excited for this one. I got Tom Dimitrovich, who is the Vice President of, of Technical Sales at Eaton, and he is joining me today. So welcome, Tom. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Oh, man, I'm excited to, to have you. Excited to have you. Now, where exactly are you located at again? I'm out of Weirton, West Virginia, near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. Okay. Over there, close to the, uh, the, the Power System Experience Center. Yeah, yeah, it's really close. And I and Weirton, West Virginia is like in a sliver right between Ohio and Pennsylvania. So uh my okay. wife loves this area, so that's why I'm here. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we love to, that you're here with us and we like like to get these conversations started, Tom, just by hearing about your journey to where you're at now. Oh man, I what a journey. We could go all day with that, brother. Okay. All right, let's go. <laughs> all right. Um, so what do you want to hear? You want to hear how I got, uh, how I got to be vice president of technical sales or oh, well, uh, maybe start back. Where'd you, where'd you go to school at? Oh, oh, well, I went to, uh, I, I grew up in the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, Eloquipa PA. And I went to college at, uh, Gannon university, which is up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Okay. And, uh, it, uh, you know, I went to school for electrical engineering, my, my brother's an electrical engineer. And, and at the time I was going to go for EE tech uh, when I was trying to figure out my dad in my, my dad was uh, worked in a steel mill. Okay. Jo Jones and Lachlan steel corporation. So his dream was my boys are going to get a college degree. And, and, uh, and that's what, that's what we did. Um, it was never a question of, are you going to go to college? It was what college are you going to go to? So, um, and, and, and it was, it was good. You know, I, I don't know that college is for everybody, but, uh, it worked out good for both myself and my brother. I went for, I was going to go for EE tech, a, a two year degree. My, my brother said, Hey, just go for electrical engineering. If you're going to put the energy into two years, go for, so I did. And, um, Gannon was trying to focus, I think at that time on, uh, on what they call digital, like, you know, like, uh, microprocessor designs and things like that, because that, you know, I graduated in 90, so it was 86 to 90 when I went into college. But I fell in love with power systems. I um, I did an internship in Canton, Ohio, power systems development. You know, when you're doing internships, it's like I was I was working with my uncle in construction jobs and stuff like that. And then I, 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 I started uh, my own little business where I was building lean-tos and, and things like that, sheds and whatnot, putting roofs on. And then um, I wanted to do something more in engineering. So I got my resume together and uh, power systems development in Canton. They hired me a small consulting firm and Paul O'Connor, Mr. O'Connor, he says, um, when he hired me, I, I you know, I'm like, what am I going to, you know, what are they going to have me do and stuff? And he says, uh, make up a project. Think, take a couple days, make something up. Uh, it doesn't have to be a real world and we'll teach you. I'm like, wow, that that's pretty freaking cool. I like yeah. that. You know, and I mean, who hires somebody and then says, make up a project, right? So I came with, I said, I want to design a substation. So I sat down in his office as I want to design a substation. I had all these books he had given me to read. And he goes, well, he says, you're bit off a lot more than you can chew. He says, I got an idea. He says, we're doing a systems analysis study for Union Carbide down in West Virginia. And you're going to do the study. I'm like, oh, 
well, great. I said, what's a, what's a short circuit and coordination study? He says, I uh, gave me some books. He gave me some IEEE books. And he says, go figure out what you need to do. Uh, here's the one line diagrams for the plant. So I did, I went and I, I read the, the IEEE books and I figured out what my game plan was. I had to do a walk down. I had to create the, the, I had to make sure the one line diagram was updated. I had to do the impedance diagram and I had it all laid out. And, um, and that whole summer I did by hand a short circuit and coordination study. I built my own light table for my time current characteristic curves. And it was, it was absolutely awesome. And then at the end of the summer, he, he laid SKM systems analysis software on the table. And he said, tell me what this stuff does. And I installed it in the computer and I basically did in about two days, what you did all everything summer. that I spent all summer doing. Okay. And, and I'll tell you, Chris, you know, what was the most awesome part of the whole thing? When you do a hand calculation of short circuit currents, Throughout a, a and it's a it, this was a uh, this was an unground it, w- well, it was grounded through a zigzag, delta delta transformers all over the place twenty three hundred volts, paper insulated lead cables it was an old plant, and I did the stuff by hand and then when I ran the numbers in the software and I compared they were almost identical, and wow. that was such a rewarding experience i mean i literally i was like high-fiving everybody in their cubicles i'm like i matched every one of those numbers i was so happy when i left there paul o'connor does not know how he changed my life because i went i was really good at uh, computer design you know using we used the 8086 processor back then you know and and i would i would lay out all my little controls and stuff And I went back, I told my Dean of Engineering, I said, I want to go power. And Jerry Selvaggi, Mr. Selvaggi was uh, was the power systems engineering class teacher. And they were really phasing out their power systems engineering. Uh, There was three people in my power systems classes. Three. You can't hide in a a class of three people. Okay. (laughs) You know? So, um, and, and, and he would bring real world projects that he was, because he had his consulting firm. He would bring problems to the class and we would help them solve them. And I'll tell you what, it was, I, I just, I I was, I just absolutely loved it. I, nothing, nothing, sir, nothing was better than crawling over a transformer, you know, on, on my little breadboard, if I made a mistake, it went and it was over. Right. You make a mistake in what we do and it's a big boom, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, unfortunately, sometimes it happens, but, um, but I, I just, I, 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 that changed my whole career. That changed it, it. That summer, I went back to power systems development. And, and it was funny. It was, he was like, we don't have any openings. He says, we had an opening for an intern. He says, but, you know, if I have an opening, I'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll add you on. But, you know, work it, in the consulting business, your, your workload depends, you know, tells you if you need to hire people. And, you know, I, it is what it is. So then I went to work for Gilbert Commonwealth. Uh, because of my experience with, um, with, with in Canton, Ohio, with power systems development and, and systems analysis software and all that good stuff, because of that experience, that got me to my job at Gilbert Commonwealth, uh, which was also a consulting engineering firm. And I was doing short circuit studies, coordination studies, um, and, and, and systems design. So I worked in, uh, what I loved about Gilbert was they had industrial, commercial, uh, fossil power plants, nuclear power plants, and transmission distribution. So my goal was to get through all five. I did a project in an industrial. I did a project uh, in uh, fossil, and I got into uh, oh, and I did uh, commercial. I got into nuclear, and then I they shipped me down to Florida for Crystal River Unit Three, and I worked. and They they didn't want me to leave, right? So. I was on a six month assignment for three years. Okay. It was, I'd get done with my one project and they'd say, Hey, we're going to extend you another six months. Would you help us with the battery calculations? Sure. And I got done with that one. It's, Hey, you know, we're doing an MCC replacement. Can you help us with that? There's another six months. Well, I'm like, I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm young guy and uh, yeah. I'm like you know, I'm scuba year. diving, I'm fishing, I'm shooting trap. Uh, I'm, I'm like, this is really cool. And then, uh, then my mom ended up with cancer 
And then, and I said, I got to get back to Pittsburgh. And that's when I came to Eaton and the rest is history, man. I I've been with Eaton since, uh, 96. I was okay. thinking 95, but it's 96. 96. Wow, man. That is, yeah. what a story, man. That is, a, that's awesome. Oh, it's, I tell you, it's been a, it's been a journey. And I, you know, I, a lot of people have, they know exactly what they want to do in five years. Mm-hmm. Did, you ever, did you ever get that question in an interview? Where do you want to be in five years? Oh, yeah. You know, and you know what I say? I want to be employed. <laughs> I want to be employed and I want to be adding value to whoever I'm working for. Right, right. And this you side know. of the dirt, that's usually my answer. I want to be on this side of the dirt, you know. <laughs> I, well, yeah, that's, that's the truth. I want to be on the right side of the grass. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's but, awesome, man. Well, I mean, you, you you really, you're impacting so many people out there, Tom, with, with the stuff you're making. Any, any advice, because this is all about the hero conversations, trying to get people excited about our industry. What advice would you give someone that wants to pursue some, a career like yourself? Uh, you know, <laughs> What advice would I, if somebody wants to be like an engineer, I would say, I would say, I know for me, it was hard work. You know, there, I I had one of my, one of my roommates in college, Mike Pensenstatler, he was going to school to be a veterinarian. Okay. I would, I would study my butt off. I, physics, I, I would be reading that physics book. And one time I threw the physics book across the floor because I'm like, I don't get it. Mike walked over, grabbed that book. Literally, Chris, this is exactly what he went into the, his bedroom. I'm, I turned the TV on. 20 minutes later, he came out and he taught me that chapter. Never had physics. Okay. Some people are just that smart. And some people have to work very hard. I worked very, I studied my butt off. I, I never settled for, um, for if I got a C, I earned that C. And I was still proud of that C, <laughs> right? right? You know, it, it, you gotta be, you, you, you've gotta be a type of an individual that can accept failure mm-hmm. as a learning experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that goes on everything. If you're not failing at something, you're not doing anything. And I think what stops a lot of people is they're a fear of failing, yeah. of asking a bad question. And, and some people will actually go to extents to lie when asked questions, right? I mean, I was just talking to an individual who had a business and he had to let somebody go because the, the gentleman that he was trying to work with, that he had working for him, would just not tell the truth. He would tell them to go do something. And he'd say, did you do that? Yeah, I did. And he'd say, um, did you measure this to this? Yes, I did. And then he'd go out there and he'd says, it was obvious he didn't do that, Mm -hmm. but you can't teach somebody. You will never, you will never learn anything if you don't recognize your own capabilities and your own weaknesses and strengths. Right. So, you know, and I don't care what, I don't care if you were going to go to school to be an engineer, you're going to go uh, to be a, an elect. The other thing too is I think a lot of people think, and, 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 and I could tell you just from my own experience, my, in my family, my, you know, my dad said, you're going to go to college, right? And so we knew we were going to college. Um, but not everybody should go to college. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot, like I'm, I'm really good with my hands. I really enjoy working on things. And, and I, you know, I always sit there and think, boy, I wonder if I would have gone down the trade route, would I be, would I own my own business today? Would I, would I have my own contracting business? Because if you're really good with your hands, if you're the best troubleshooter, you're doing, you know, you, the only thing you have to do is learn the business angle of that. And maybe I could have been a business owner at this point. You never know. You only have to accept where you're at, what you're doing. But always, and, and, and for me, saying that I'm going to start my own business, I always wanted to start my own business. Oh, even as an engineer, I always said, you know, I'd love to have my own business. But there's that comfort zone you're in. You know, you can say, am I going to leave this job to possibly fail and not have, uh, and not have uh, an, an income? You've got a family to think about. You've got uh, you've got bills you have to pay. I have school loans I had to pay, and all that good stuff. So there's risk involved, and sometimes you've got to you've got to understand your risks, 
Um, but you just, I think it's just hard work, no matter what it is. It's just pouring on the coal. It is. That's all. It is great advice. Great advice. And, and another thing that I'd love to get your perception on is, you know, people, when they think about engineering or they think about industry in specific, or they think about power, you know, they mm-hmm. have, there are certain perceptions out there and they're not, they're not all positive either. So if you had a chance to debunk something around engineering or power, that's, uh, that's just not accurate. What, what would that be? Oh man, there is a lot of stuff that is accurate, <laughs> you know? And, 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 um, but here, so, the, one of the perceptions, I think, when you hear somebody come out of college, just a, somebody who's a college graduate, and I, I, a lot of people will look at that person and say, boy, he's really smart. It's not necessarily true. You may be, I call things, you may be very book smart, mm-hmm. but you not, may not be very practical smart, right? right? So there, and, and I think there are probably, and there are a lot of people that come out of school who also think they're smart, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I would say it, it doesn't even have to come out of school. There are probably people in a trade that think they're smart and they know everything because hey, I've done that. I've been working in the business for 20 years. You know, I've done this, I've done that. But there's a, 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 a level of being able to recognize you need to, my dad used to call it, you got to eat humble pie. Right. You got to be able to sit down and say, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not the the guru on the job here, but together we're going to get it done. And I think the the big the big myth is that the engineer is going to be the person who's going to solve the problems, and you know that person knows everything, and it's not the truth at all. Like I said earlier, or, or I don't know if I said it to you or who, but college teaches you to learn a mass amount of information in a short period of time. When you come out of college, you've got so much learning to do. You know, people ask me, what are, well, what's the key to success? I say, be a sponge. Learn as much as you can from everybody. Hmm. The guy pushing a broom can teach you something. No doubt. You know, and you might be able to share something you know with that person. So there's, it doesn't matter what you're doing, what your job is in life or in on a project. Every individual plays an important role in success of the business and of each other for sure you know so you know in, in the engineer on the job i'll never forget my first <laughs> i did a project and i ordered equipment and the uh the the site electrician called me up and he said are you the engineer that's like my first one of my first jobs and i said yeah I'm, I'm the engineer on the job he said can you come out to the site i'm like oh yeah i couldn't wait put my white helmet on yeah i had my my new boots on my uh my my new work pants, you know, for the job site pants, you know? So I go out to the job site and I see this huge, big gray box sitting there. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's a big piece of equipment. And he goes, yeah. He says, that's what I want to talk to you about. I said, oh really? He goes, yeah. He says, you bought that. I'm like, I bought that. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh yeah. Is that, is that this? He goes, yeah. And he goes, now you're going to tell me how I'm going to get that through that little door over there. And I'm like, I never thought about that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you got to get that in that little door and i'm like i chris i'm telling you i was like i had one of those moments where your jaw just drops right. you know and then he put his arm around me and he goes don't worry he says i got you covered he's i already talked to the manufacturer we can break it down in sections and get it in there he says but i will have to make two modifications to doors inside he said i want you to know about it and i'm like oh my gosh <laughs> Oh man, I'll tell you, but, and I think that was the time when I realized you don't know everything and you got to make sure you connect with everybody. Yeah. And, and a good engineer is a problem solver. Right. And, 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 and we're all engineers. Everybody thinks that everybody goes, well, you, you're only an engineer if you get a degree. That's in my opinion, there are a lot of electricians who are engineers because they can look at a project or a problem and take what they know, the fundamentals, and solve that problem, keep it safe, right. save the customer money, and get that job done fast. And I would say that person is probably more of an engineer than I am, mm-hmm. depending upon what you're working on. Sure. I sure. just have, I used to call it a pigskin. And someone said, no, Tom, that's a sheepskin. 
<laughs> but shows you how smart I am, right? But no, but I, you know, I think that uh, that you know, going to going to college teaches you how to learn information. But everybody is uh, is is an engineer in their own way. That's for sure, for sure. Yeah. I, I guess maybe one one question I'd love to know about your role, particularly the role you're in right now, is when are you the happiest? You know, what 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 work brings you the most joy? You know, I'll tell you what. So. When I first started working for Eaton, I went from, I was, uh, in, I was at a nuclear power plant and I was designing power systems. I was engineering drawings. I was uh, working on the security system, put an entirely new security system in for a nuclear plant, which was really cool. And then my mom had cancer. So I wanted to get home. So I got home and I started working at Eaton. And my goal was, I don't want to take a pay cut. I want I want to stay as engineering and my job, I always said, I never want to be a salesperson. I am an engineer. People would say, are you in sales? I am an electrical engineer. I was, I was defensive about that. Right. So I went to work at Eaton and I was an application engineer, but I was on a help desk. Okay. And I, in my mind though, Chris, I was like, Oh man, I got to wear one of those little earbuds. Right. And I've got to take a call and then I'm going to have to work with somebody and I'm going to be looking at catalog numbers and trying to figure out what to order. And I'm thinking, this is not me, but then I'm thinking my mother needs me. I need to be home. I will make this work. Okay. Eaton's a big company. It it, it was transitioning from Westinghouse to Eaton at the time. So I went and I sat on that and, and, and I had all the books. They, the, the, the gentleman I was replacing wasn't leaving yet. So I had to sit and read catalogs and, and I was all frustrated. And then finally I get on the phones and I'm telling you, it was like a light bulb. I got the fir- the first phone call I got was, um, or one of the first few was a gentleman in a wastewater treatment plant. And he says, I answered the phone. I said, Eaton, this is Thomas, the advanced product support center. This is Thomas Dimitrovich. And he goes, he goes, boys, I need your help. I said, what do you need, sir? He goes, listen, he's, I'm in a wastewater treatment plant. He goes, I need your help right now because in about 20 minutes, I'm going to be knee deep in it, literally. <laughs> I'm like, okay, what do you got? He goes, I got a programmable logic controller. He says, it's a tan box, Westinghouse tan box. And then, and then boom, I am, I grabbed Jim Babcock and I grabbed this person on the phone and we walked him through and we solved his problem. He thanked me and hung up. And I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, this is what it is all about because it, it is about solving problems. I had, I had a sales guy call me in from Seattle, Washington. And he says, Hey, he says, uh, I'm going in to see a customer and I need to know everything there is about an IQ analyzer because and he says, I don't know anything. And the IQ analyzer at that time was our most complicated monitoring device. Right. And I'm like, there is no way. I said, when are you going in? I said, well, can we schedule a call? He said, no, no, no. He said, I'm going in right now. He said, you got about 10 minutes. And I told him, I says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I said, because this isn't going to happen. I says, I want you to go in there, show him the device, tell him, look, and, and I was on a help desk that had 24-7 service because we bailed people out of of uh, from being knee deep in it, in a, in a, in in those, in those situations. Right. So I told him, I says, you're going to give him and you're going to tell him that when they buy our products, they're very technical. And if they have a problem, they have a toll free number to call, call this 800 number. And there were four of us on the phones. I said, one of us is going to pick up like we always do, just like I did for him. And, and I said, and then we'll walk him through what the product is and we'll answer his questions. And he's like, that's a good idea. So I told the other three guys, I said, Hey, if, if uh, I can't, oh, I can't think of his name, Paul Fritz. I said, if Paul calls, this is what's going on. His customer is going to ask questions. So he's going to be just, you're just going to basically answer his questions about the product. Just like we always do. And he's like, they're like, okay, great. So I got the call. And, and I said, Hey, you know, and, and he asked all the, all the right questions. I walked him through the product, showed him how it was done. And, and he's like, well, how do I get a hold of you guys? I said, it's 1-800 and I gave him the number. I can't even remember the number off the top of my head, but it was APSC in the very last four digits. And 
I said, and we worked 24 seven. We carried back then we carried pagers. Oh, man. Okay. And we had one cell phone. It was an AT&T big gray cell phone and we passed it with each other. Uh, today we all have cell phones, right? But, um, Paul sent me a case of smoked salmon. <laughs> nice. He flew it in. And you know what? I didn't eat salmon at the time. I gave it all away. <laughs> but That's a great those story. in my, in my career, I can say that was one of the best jobs I ever had because I, I was solving problems, real world issues. No and, and what I do today with the educational stuff I put on and, and people who know me will send me emails. They'll contact me with problems. I've helped people with other manufacturers products. Right. Okay. I had Donnie Cook, Shelby County, Alabama, call me up and he said, Hey, I've got a, uh, a, a his main went out at a jail down there. It transfer switch transferred over and it tripped the generator circuit breaker. And he says, uh, you know, they've been pulling maintenance on the, on the generator. He says, I'm trying to figure this out. And I said, well, send me the one line diagram. I did the coordination study for him. I told him exactly what was wrong. None of his breakers had the right settings in them and they weren't my product. And he went back he, and, and he hired, uh, I don't know who he hired, but he hired somebody to go back and, and uh, set everything correctly. And that's to me, that is the satisfaction I want out of a job. That's it. That's it, it don't matter what my title is. It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, well, obviously, matters on what you get paid, right? But you don't want to. You don't want to be. Uh, uh, you don't want to be struggling. And uh, and you, there's there's joy in what you do, but there's also you, you need to get paid for that, sure. right? So, but I I thoroughly I thoroughly enjoy helping people solve problems. Man, that's great. That is so great. Thank you for all the examples. I mean, it was wonderful. Just hearing about your career, I, I, I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I do want to get talk about you outside of work now. So let's let's take a, a, a turn down a dirt road for a minute. So sure. what what hobbies do you got, man? What do you enjoy doing for fun? Well, so I love to. I, well, okay, I love to hunt and fish. Okay. I love to hunt, and and I had a bird dog at one point. I had a Brittany a lady. She was a junior hunter. Nice. Uh, on, on quail and, 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 and up here it's grouse, right? So okay. we, we hunt grouse up in here, but grouse is really th thinned out over the years. It's not like I was when I was a kid, Okay. but because of the travel and everything, I don't get out hunting as much. So I picked up a different hobby. Now I play my guitar. So I'm, I love music. Okay. I always have loved music. So I, when I was in high school, I played saxophone and in college I played saxophone, um, played a little bit of drums uh, but uh, so I took up the guitar. It was my nephew. My little nephew wanted to, wanted to learn how to play guitar. So I said, I made him a deal. I said, okay, I will buy you a guitar and I will pay for lessons, but I'm going to buy a guitar too. And to make sure you practice, we're going to practice together. Oh, cool. Well, he started, and we started out good. We, you know, I would take him to, I had his books and everything. So I, you know, I couldn't sit in there and say, Hey, I want you to pay I, I want to teach both of us because, you know, it, it just wouldn't be fair to him. So, uh, so he took his classes and then I was practicing on my own and then we, he would come home and we would practice together, but then he got older and he wanted to play football. He wanted to play baseball. And so that took the place of, uh, of the uh, guitar, but I was like, you know what? I'm liking this. Yeah. So I've had my guitar for, for quite some time. And, when I started to travel more, I realized I, I could not tell my wife I'm coming home. I haven't been home from Sunday to Friday. I'm coming home Friday and I'm going to go sit in a tree bow hunting on Saturday. Right. I just, I just couldn't do it, you know? So home time is really important to me. And, um, and, and, but now you would think, over these COVID years, right? This, this year, you would think that Tom would have been in a tree this past fall, but I mean, I got, I've got my Marshall half stack. I got my twin reverb. I've got my Telecaster, my Stratocaster, my Gibson Les Paul, my Taylor acoustic. And now I've got to record. Now I can actually mic it and record some stuff. Man. So I've been experimenting with that. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I wipe the guns down every now and then and I still have those. I've got a quite a good collection. I collected, uh, I used to collect uh, Smith and Wesson and Colts. I love okay. Colt, the, the Colt Python and the Diamondback and all the old Smiths. I call them the gold, the gold box Smiths. I don't know if you're familiar with the five screws and four screw Smiths and all that good stuff. So 
you know, a, a Smith collector knows the screws on, knows the number of screws on a gun, <laughs> on nice, a pistol, right? Nice. That's awesome, man. So, so it sounds like you have a lot of fun playing the guitar, man. That's great. Yeah, I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. And and a friend of mine who he used to bring his guitar to work uh, when we were at uh, at a specific building here in Pittsburgh area, he used to bring his guitar and then we would play together in a conference room. Uh, he had a tailor and I had acoustic. We would play our acoustics and he taught me a lot. Yep. And he left. He went to work at, at our Asheville facility and then he worked in Raleigh. And then, uh, then he left the, the the company and he worked for somebody out west. And and he just called me the other la- this week. Uh, well, no, he, what's today? Today's Friday. Yeah, it was this week. He called me this week. He said, "Hey, I'm back in town, so now I got a guitar buddy back." Nice, again. nice man. That's awesome. Yeah. Now, how about your family? You mentioned your wife there. So, what would you like to share about your family? Well, my uh, my family on my my I have one. I've only have one brother. But uh, my father came from a family of 12. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 12 kids. And so uh, I lost my mother and then I lost my dad. But, um, but you know, with, a, with such a big family, my, 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 uncle, my, uncle, uh, my uncle Steve, last survivor of the Melmody Massacre. So the Melmody Massacre during World War II was over in uh, – over in Melmody, France, right, and uh, the it was uh, Pfeiffer was the uh, was the was the uh, I think he was uh, I don't know what level rank he was with the with the German military, mm-hmm. it was SS, and they captured a column, and my uncle was in that column. They put them all in a field. You'll read about it in books. You'll see it in movies where they uh, they executed everybody in a field, and uh, only a few survived. My uncle managed to hit the ground. When the when the shooting stopped, he played dead, and uh, the uh, as the soldiers were walking by, uh, you know, making sure they did their job, uh, and then when they left, he laid there for a few hours, and he got up, and a few other couple other people got up, and then they ran back to a farm, and uh, you know, it, one of those things where uh, you know they made him shuck their clothes and all that other good stuff, and he was blonde, <laughs> and he looked German. Right. So he was blonde haired and and he wasn't really into sports. So he says he's walking down a road and a, a, a U.S. Jeep pulls up you know, and they got the gun on the, on him. And he says he's raising his hands. He's going, U.S., U.S., you know, your soldier, you know, U.S. soldier. He says, uh, don't shoot because they didn't have their uniforms. And and then uh, what do they ask him? Who won the World Series? <laughs> And my uncle Steve goes, I don't know who won the World Series. He <laughs> says, I don't follow baseball. He says, I'm from Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. My mother is, is Sophia. My, my father's uh, John. He says, uh, we live in uh, 1252. And he gives him his dad dress. And he's like, you know, I'm a U.S. soldier, you know. And and uh, But the, you know, think about it. My, my grandmother got the letter that uh, he was killed in battle because they assumed that he was killed right. and and then she had to get the next letter that says that uh, that that he was uh, he was alive so uh, wow. but there were four brothers that were in World War II at the same time and uh, so you know he always has good stories my uncle Ray uh, he was at, in the tanks my uh, my uncle Murph was is John we always called him Murph my family was big on my not my dad but the rest of my family was always big on nicknames. I mean, I had an aunt Pippi. I mean, who call, who calls her their aunt Pippi? You know, I had a right. Murph instead. His name was John. Um, Doody. She was uh, so uh, was Sophia. I, I mean, well, you know, they were just big on nicknames. But my dad never liked that. But um, but he was the youngest of twelve. He was youngest wow. of twelve. Wow. So it's just me and my brother. And uh, my brother works. Uh, he works for Eaton as well. Okay. So he used to work for AEP. Out in, that's why I went to Canton, Ohio, because oh. he was living in Canton, working for Columbus, uh, Columbus Power or Ohio Power, which then became AEP. Cool. And then, uh, you know, we have my wife and I have two dogs. We have uh, labs, two okay. labs. Nice, so, nice yeah. man. Well, you sound like you a fun, fun time. Family's important, and and thank you. Yeah. Tom, for sharing with us, for sure, man. That- no, not a problem. I, you know, and my, my, my mother always brings a, she she was a special person. And it doesn't matter how long, she died in two, right, right around 911, right before 911 occurred. Wow. And it doesn't matter how long, that, that woman was just a special woman. So I apologize, but she, no. she, was, uh, she was just a very, uh, very good person. And, and when you lose a parent, you know, 
it, it, it never, it never leaves you. Sure. It never leaves you. Yeah. Well, Tom, this has been great getting to know you. you I love your passion. I mean, I just, it's, it's been, it's been a true blessing for me just to, just to meet you and to hear your story. And, uh, man, we call the eco ask why, and this is, I, I guess my favorite part of the show is, is the why. So somebody wants to know, you know, Tom, what is your personal why? What would that be? Wow. Why, why I do what I do? Just your personal why you, you, you're, you're the drive behind Tom. Oh man, well, my my drive it it is uh, how I was raised. It's a part of me. It, my family has always been passionate about everything. My dad always told me, you know, you're you're a Dimitrovich. You're going to succeed no matter what you do. You just got to put 110 percent into it. He never settled for anything less. And um, and we and we as a family always poured 110 percent of everything we did. So it's just I think it's part of my fabric. It's just if I wasn't doing this, if I well, no matter what I would be doing. I would, even if I failed, I knew that I put 110% in that failure, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that's just the way I was raised. I think it's all about family. It's all about how, uh, how, you, uh, how you interact. And, and you know, some people are blessed with really great backgrounds like that, really great family. Some people aren't as blessed, right? right? right. But, uh, and, and there, are, there are those portions of those people who aren't as blessed with that family environment that still find a passion because of their friends. Yeah. No it's doubt. all about relationships in my opinion. It is. Yeah. Tom, this has been great. You, thank you so much. We'll make sure for our listeners out there that we put links to everything, every way to get in touch oh. with Tom, to follow him, his personal website. Now, YouTube channels, all, all, all those connections points he's put, you know, he put out great information on a regular basis. So I really encourage listeners to check him out and Tom, just thank you so much again for taking the time with us on eco ask why. Thank you for the opportunity, Chris. Always good. Absolutely. You have a wonderful day. I'm going to try my best. You do the same. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.